There's just a great energy and spirit in this room. And uh, could you help me just welcome our friends that are watching online from all over? Could you just greet them? We're so glad you're tuning in from all over Maryland, all over many different states, even different nations. We're so glad you're tuning in. And on your seat, you got an Easter card with all of our gathering times. Yo, next week is Easter. And l listen, I'm not like making this up. People are four times more likely to receive an invitation and come to church with you next Sunday than any other weekend of the year. There is a real spiritual sensitivity that people have and an openness around Easter. Four times, more, look at your neighbor, say four times. Four times more likely, friends, coworkers, family members. And so we'd love for you to bring them. We just know that Jesus is gonna do amazing things. Three locations, 12 gatherings, one gospel. Come on, Jesus is gonna change people's lives. And we pray that it's your friends and your family members uh, let's be bringers. Let's see what Jesus will do. My name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And come on, how many of you love you some Pastor Wade? Don't we just love our pastor? And a man that has had a big impact on Pastor Wade is a guy by the name of Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands. Uh, they've had a massive influence on us and a real inspiration. And recently, Pastor Chris said this, and, and Pastor Wade's been just processing this statement. Chris Hodges said, you live or we live by principle, not by pressure. Say the word pressure. Pressure. We, we all face pressure. You have work pressure, financial pressure, family pressure, marital pressure, season of life you're in, pressure. Just there's a collective pressure in our culture right now to this kind of undercurrent to throw off your belief in God, to kind of treat you if you're crazy, if you believe in God. Um, it's, it's crazy town. If you, if you knew even some of the different history books that in certain school systems are trying to take out things like the Gettysburg Address. Why you got to get rid of the Gettysburg? Because there's too much God talk coming from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the Mayflower Compact, there are some history books that are keeping the Mayflower Compact out because it gives the mission of the pilgrims seeking religious freedom coming to America. So how many of you know there is pressure all around us? There is cultural pressure. There's personal pressure that we feel. Sometimes in life, you feel like the hammer. You, you're crushing it. And sometimes in life, you feel like the nail. You feel like you are getting repeatedly pounded, right? Look at your neighbor and say, it's all on. It's all on. And we don't always talk about it, but we're in a battle. We're, you're in a battle for your family. You're in a battle for your faith. You're in a battle for your children. And God never designed us to live a life where he was unnecessary. He designed us to live a life where we would need him. And man, we need him. We don't live by pressure. We live by principle. And I want to give you three principles today from one story in Mark chapter 5. And, and what I, one of the things I love about the Bible, it's filled with raw people and just real life pressures. And, and there's some principles in this story, three things. And we're going to see a father battling to save his daughter's life. And you may be here and you're, you're battling to save your, your child's life from, from heroin addiction, from drifting from God, whatever it might be. Maybe that's not your situation, but I want you to lean in and kind of glean from this story for your situation. Mark chapter 5, this is, this is an amazing story. Verse 21 says this. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. The first principle that I want you to see, principle number one, is we have got to be desperate for Jesus. We have got to be desperate to get to Jesus. Jesus can do anything, but we have got to get to him. And notice the scripture says, Jairus fell at his feet. My man was important. He was known. He was wealthy. He was a synagogue leader. It, but it wasn't one of those moments where he said, let my people talk to your people and maybe we'll connect. How many of you know dignity goes out the door when you need a deliverance from God? Listen, forget public appearance. You need a breakthrough. Are you with me? You don't really care what you look like. You don't care what you sound like. You're like, Jesus, if you don't come and change this, it's over. And that's where Jairus was. He was so desperate for Jesus. But I want you to see this. Jairus was a dad. Jairus was a, a father. He was the spiritual thermostat in his home. 
And dads, I just want to, I want to challenge you in this. And I know that every dad at times feels insecure. And, and many times we just say, well, my wife is the more spiritual one. And that's probably true. But what happens in your heart affects everything in your home. Come on, dads, talk to me. Moms, talk to me. What, what happened, listen, some of, you, some of you may be single moms in this season, and there's a grace on your life where you have to fill both roles. And I'm telling you, you feel in over your head, but there is a spiritual grace on parents to seek God. If Jairus didn't seek Jesus, his family wouldn't have had a breakthrough. And there are certain things where we, we, can't, we can only lead people spiritually to where we've already been. That's why I believe that when Moses' leadership was done, his era was done, God raised up Joshua, and Joshua led the children of Israel in the Old Testament to the promised land. Why? Because Joshua knew the way. He had already been there before. He was one of the 12 spies. And so I can't take someone on a journey unless I've been there before. And so, dads, I want to just, I want to challenge you. And I know that sometimes we feel so small and insignificant, but listen, why is it that when our kids are little, we, we pray with them and we pray for them? But when they get older and they become teenagers or they're grown and it gets awkward, we only pray for them and we stop praying with them, right? How many of you know that might be common, but it doesn't have to be your new normal, right? We can, we can lean in. Come on, dads. I want to know, how can you lean in and spiritually set a higher standard in your home? This Jairus was desperate. He said, I've got, to, I've, got to lay, I've got to lay aside my ego. I've got to lay aside lame excuses. What would happen? What would happen in your home? Come on, track with me. I know I'm challenging you. What would happen in your home if we didn't leave it to somebody else to set the spiritual temperature in our home, in our marriages, with our kids, right? Because when you invite Jesus into your home, anything can happen. But it's got to take leadership. And I love this principle. God says, listen, when you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. And sometimes, isn't it true as Christians, we, we use like Bible phrases and religious things to kind of, uh, kind of deflect from our behavior. We'll say things like this, well, I'm just waiting on God, which is basically a Christian cloaking for passivity. Like, I'm just waiting on God. Now, I've used it. I'm telling you. I'm, pe I'm speaking from experience. I'm just waiting on God. You know, I did a quick little study in, in the Hebrew. The, the word uh, patient, I'm patiently waiting on God. The word patient shows up 53 times in the Hebrew. Only four times does it mean not taking action and just patiently waiting. Four times out of 53. Forty-nine times the word patiently in the Hebrew is the picture of a, a person that's carrying a burden, like a woman about to give birth. There's a, there's a burden, there's a gnawing, there's a longing on the inside. And the other root word that is attached to patiently is to like spring up into the air and dance or jump. So watch this. It's not a little known fact that Pastor Wade hates cats, right? <laughs> Someone says, so sad. Well, you know, when we were moving here, I thought it was going to be in my, you know, employee contract that we had to get rid of our cat. But it, he, he loved us, and he said, no, you can keep your cat. And our cat is Chewbacca. We let our kids name the cat when we first got him, wrapped him up in a box on Christmas a few years ago. So he's Chewbacca, right? And I, he's maybe, he might be the only cool cat on the planet. I don't know, but he is cool. But cats, if you have cats, you know this. They will hide around the corner and wait for you to walk by so that they can jump out at you. How many of you have had a cat? Just wave at me. You know what I'm talking about. You got cats. They just wait. You're coming around the corner, and they spring up, and they jump at your legs, and you're like, what are you doing? That is actually the biblical picture of waiting on God. That's what it means to wait patiently for God. Come on, listen. She may not recover. It's okay. <laughs> listen, I, I've got good news for you. Waiting patiently for God is not passivity. Jesus is waiting for you to ambush him. He is waiting for you to pursue him. He's waiting for somebody to say, once you get hungry enough, once you get sick of your situation, get desperate and seek me. Come on, Freedom Church. God is waiting for you to ambush him. And I love this story because we're about to see some real desperation. Principle number one, we've got to get desperate for Jesus. And sometimes while we're waiting for our miracle, we need to celebrate the miracle that God's doing for somebody else. And that's easier said than done because when you need a breakthrough, all you can see is that breakthrough. You have tunnel vision on what you need. And you're like, God, I know you love all of them, but I don't care about all of them. All I care about is this breakthrough. 
And, and this is what I've had to realize. Do you realize the, the pie of God's blessing is big enough that when he gives someone else a slice, there's, there's more than enough left for you? The blessing on my life doesn't take away from your life, and the blessing on your life doesn't take away from my life. He has a limitless supply. But we don't, like, preach that to ourselves when we're in the moment. All we care about is our need, our breakthrough, and, and we've got to recognize that sometimes other people interrupt the process. Watch this. This story, verse 24, a large crowd followed Jesus and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding or hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, say desperation. She was in desperation. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind. Listen, she didn't wait in line. She went gangster on him. She came up behind Jesus. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind in the crowd. She touched his cloak for she thought to herself, if I just touch his clothes, Jesus can do anything. If I just get close to him, and immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. But what an interruption to Jairus' miracle. Bob Goff, the author of Love Does and the book Everybody Always, he says, if we're going to love people like Jesus, then we better get used to being interrupted all the time. So Jairus, if I'm him, I'm a little bit frustrated because this woman's got more passion and desperation than I do. I mean, she didn't, she didn't wait till she had an appointment. She didn't sign the waiver form. She didn't wait in line. She spent all she had. She went to doctors and no one could help her. And she said, if I don't touch Jesus, I'm a lost cause. She was desperate. She was culturally unclean. She should have been in her house. Shame should have kept her in isolation. How many of you know shame can only keep you in isolation so long? You've got to step out of that isolation and say, I don't care what I look like. I don't care who I have to be around. If i got to be around a room of perfect strangers so I can connect with God, I'm going to do it. She was desperate. Public appearance does not matter when you need a spiritual breakthrough. She said, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. I want to just give you one note. It says the hem of his garment. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. And in Jewish culture, the, the rabbis or the teachers would wear prayer shawls, right? They would wear these prayer shawls. They're called a talit. And, and on the prayer shawls, there were these tassels on the hem of the prayer shawl. And it wasn't just tassels. In the tassels was woven the word of God, the promises of God, the commands of God and the promises of God. Literally, he's wearing on the hem of his garment the promises of God. But what's crazy is in that culture, only someone in your family could touch your prayer shawl if you were a rabbi or a teacher. This woman, I don't even know if she knew what she was doing, but guess what? When you get so desperate, you don't care. You will grab a hold of the promises of God. And I came to tell somebody today that you've got more promises than you do problems. Come on. She was reaching out to grab a hold of a promise, and she grabbed a hold of a person who was the son of God. And Jesus' response, watch, only a, a family member could touch a rabbi's talit. And he calls her daughter. Jairus isn't the only father battling for a daughter in this story. This woman is now a daughter. But Jairus, as, as godly as he may have been, I'm sure. Now, if I'm Jairus, I'm putting myself in the story. I'm like, lady, that's great. But don't let your struggle and don't let your drama interrupt my schedule here. We've got to get to my daughter. Right? I'm contending for that. Don't let your struggle interrupt my schedule at all. And a uh, little confession, my wife Anna and our boys, they, they are pretty convinced that I have a condition called hyperhidrosis, which means you just sweat a lot. <laughs> like I'm not playing. I had to change between services, and I'll change again, whatever shirts we've got in the merch box backstage because this – so – Listen, if you see me at Forest Hill Planet Fitness and pretend like you don't know me, it's okay. I get it. I completely get it. I would pretend like I don't know me too because when I'm on a machine, not only do I get sweat all over my machine, just ask Luke, one of our worship leaders. He, 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 does, he hates it. He's like, bro, you're nasty. <laughs> I am what I am. So, I, so I'm not only having to clean my machine, I looked around and I'm like, man, I got both machines next to me nasty. And so people with their little cute squirt bottles and their paper towel, I grab the whole thing, and I'm spraying the machines, and, and I'm taking a long time. In fact, 
Sometimes I've been tempted to grab the mop out of the closet. People probably think I work at Planet Fitness because I'm so meticulously having to clean these machines. It's bad. Like, it's really bad. In fact, no joke, no exaggeration. Recently, a man came up to me. I have never met him before in my life. I don't think he comes to Freedom Church, but I've never seen him before. And he goes, we got to stick together. I'm like, and who are you? He goes, we sweat more than anybody in this whole place. Brothers got to stick together. And I was like, I didn't know it was a club. I don't want in that fraternity, but I have an odd disorder called hyperhidrosis, okay? And so people will get pretty ticked off if you take a long time cleaning their machine. Like if it's in the morning and they've got to get to work, they're like, listen, I don't know what your odd little struggle and disorder is why you sweat so much, but you're interfering with my schedule. If I'm gyrus, I'm like, lady, get your miracle. That's great. Get your miracle and get out of the way. We have got to get to my home. I'm desperate for Jesus. Are you with me? I love this. Watch this. It says in verse 30, at once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? This lady, she didn't wait for Jesus to lay hands on her. She laid hands on Jesus. I mean, she's crazy. You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. Here's the thing I want you to see. You can be around Jesus and not have an intimate connection with Jesus. Like you can be in the vicinity of Jesus and not touch him. Here's the thing. At Freedom Church, we are not satisfied with being the cool church in town. We're not satisfied with you just liking coming or liking the music. We want to see you have a connection to Jesus Christ. Listen, you may come in here. You may worship a little bit. You may even lift a hand. You may give. You may serve. But guess what? We come in here to worship, but we have to live out there. So I need Jesus when I'm in here. I need Jesus when I'm out there. And we are longing for you to have a connection with Jesus, to be spiritually hungry, to ask him, God, I want to. Here's the deal. This is not a condemning message. If, if you struggle being hungry for him, ask him. God, I'm hungry to be hungry. Like, I can't produce that. I need you to draw me. Uh, in my life, there has never been a season in my life where his invitation has not been stronger than my initiative. His desire to meet with you is far greater than your discipline. He knows your inconsistencies. He knows the empty promises. But guess what? If you ask him, he will put a desperation and a hunger in you where you'll reach after God and you'll be like, what has come over me? I'm desperate for him. She was desperate. Verse 32 says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling in fear. She told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter. Come on, Jairus wasn't the only one fighting for a daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You're freed of your suffering. Why can you be confident as you seek after Jesus? Why is it that we can have absolute confidence as we pursue God? It's because everybody's a somebody with Jesus. Some people treat different people differently. They're like, well, they're, they're somebody. With Jesus, come on, how many are thankful? With Jesus, everybody's a somebody. Look at these two people. They could not be more different. And they both fell at his feet. Look at, he was rich, she was poor. He was a man, she was a woman. He was ceremonial clean, she was unclean. He was known, she was a nobody. He was the center of society, she was isolated. He was the top of the social food chain, she was the bottom. Jairus had an emergency, she had a long-term condition. How many are thankful that with Jesus, they both came on the same level, and with Jesus, everybody's a somebody? There are people that God has put on your heart to invite to Easter and to come to church. And we hear the craziest things come out of people's mouths like, I don't know if I can come in the building. The walls may collapse. I might get struck by lightning. I'm For real, people think these crazy thoughts. Someone needs to tell them that everybody is a somebody with Jesus. These two people could not be more different. Thankfully, we don't live by pressure. We live by principles. Principle number one. We have got to be desperate for Jesus. Principle number two, once you get to Jesus, we have to stay committed to being in his presence and not letting go. Verse 35, it says that while Jesus was speaking, some people, say some people, some people, say it with an attitude, some people, 
Some people had the audacity to interrupt the voice of God speaking to Jairus. And they came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Why bother? Why, we all have why bother voices in our head. Why bother trying to get a breakthrough when someone else has a bigger need than you do? Why bother going after God when you know how inconsistent you are? Why bother pursuing God? That marriage is over. That business is dead. Come on. Why bother? Why bother? Why bother? Why bother to cry out? Nothing's actually going to happen. Why bother? I'll tell you why to bother. Because Jesus hears your every cry. Because Jesus knows what's on your heart even before you can articulate the words in a prayer. Because Jesus is more for you than anyone could ever be against you. And the enemy just wants to resist you and say, why bother? Well, I'll tell you why to bother. Because he saw your inconsistency and chose to love you anyways. Come on, why bother? Because when I invite Jesus into my life, anything can happen. That's why we bother. So Jesus, he's going to help Jairus kind of deal with these voices, but you've got to see Jairus' miracle didn't come immediately. It wasn't the same as this woman, right? And he's waiting patiently on God. And again, that's not passive. Waiting patiently is not the same as when you're already five minutes late for work and you're stuck at a traffic light. Waiting patiently is different than when you see that little icon spinning and you want Netflix to work and it won't work because your internet connection needs to be retested. Come on, it drives you crazy. When you're in the airport trying to get on a flight to come home and you're going through security and you're like, I'm never going to make it. These people are so dang slow in here, right? It's not the same. Every second that went by, Jairus is thinking, if this lady would get out of my way, my daughter may live. And now they're telling me, why bother? It's over. She's dead. It's done. There's nothing Jesus can do. People say, well, you know, God will never be, he'll never be early and he'll never be late. He's right on time. I just want to know what time schedule, what timetable he's on, because clearly it's not ours. Are you with me? And so here he is, and watch Jesus helps him, verse 36. Ignoring what they said, say they. Ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Who is the they in your life that you've got to stop listening to? What thoughts go through your mind? Some people will say, I'll come to church with you when hell freezes over. you got to get the they out of your mind and out of your life. Are you with me? You, well, why, why are you going to church every week anyways? Like, what do you think that's going to do for you? There are all kinds of they's in our lives, all kinds of voices. Jesus said, listen, don't be afraid. Just believe. Ignoring what they said. Listen, you don't find faith by polling the masses. It may not be popular. You may not look cool when you're pursuing a breakthrough. There may be some voices competing, trying to steal your faith. Jesus says, ignore what they are saying and lean in. Stay with me. Stay in my presence. Keep tracking with me. Sometimes, watch this, sometimes when things seem like they're falling apart, they're actually falling into place. Jesus had to go through so much just to get Jairus to this moment. Listen, if you read the story, he's on a boat with his disciples going there. A storm comes up, and Jesus has to rebuke the wind and rebuke the waves. I'm thankful that we serve a God who, can, who has authority over the seen and the unseen. The unseen spiritual things that affect the waves, that affect the circumstances, and the seen things in our lives. How many are thankful that we serve a God with authority? Jesus had to come through the storm. He had to get through my man, the crazy demoniac coming out of the caves. He had to heal this woman that he didn't even plan to heal. She laid hands on him. And now he's in that moment at just the right time. When God is working a miracle in your life, he doesn't do it just for one reason. He's always working on many levels. He gives you a breakthrough so that all the people connected to you can see his goodness. He'll give you a financial breakthrough so your kids can see his faithfulness. He'll give you favor at work, not just so that you can enjoy it, but so that people can see what it looks like when God favors a person. He, he will touch your marriage and restore your marriage so that all the people that know you and the they's and the voice that said it's over can see what Jesus can do when he's invited in. That's what he does. But sometimes it looks like things are falling apart and they're actually falling right into place. Verse 37, he did not let anyone 
follow him except Peter, James, and John and the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? They're, they're professional mourners, you know. When I'm going through a trial, I love people being merciful, but I don't need to be surrounded by professional mourners. I want someone that's going to pray and contend for a breakthrough. Amen. Jesus said, watch. He says, the child's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed him at him. They mocked him. If the they surrounding that situation would mock Jesus, guess what? They may not be that truthful or kind to you either. Sometimes when you're pursuing a breakthrough, it makes the people in your life uncomfortable. Watch what Jesus does. Principle number three. And here's where we close. We need to receive Jesus into our homes. We need to invite him in. We need to be intentional about it. It says, after he put them all out, time for doubt to be dismissed, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. Listen, this is, this is important. You may have had people walk out on your life. You may have walked through a divorce because someone said this marriage is dead. You may have had people in business leave because they said this business is dead. You may have had friends walk out. Listen, I have some good news for you. The whole world can walk out on you, but when Jesus comes into your room, guess what? You're getting back up again. Come on. Listen, friends may forsake you, but Jesus said, I'll be a friend that is closer than a brother. I'm not going to leave you. When Jesus walks into the room, dead things get up. Watch this. Verse, he says, verse 42, so he took her by the hand, and he says, listen, the hand that flung the stars into the universe, like a farmer scattering seed, the very hands that formed creation, reaches down and says, Talitha Kum, which is little girl, I say get up. That term, Talitha Kum, would have been heard in Jewish homes all the time. It was a morning greeting. Time to get up, kids. Time to get up. It's actually saying, hey, honey, time to get up. Hey, sweetie, time to get up. You would hear Talitha Kum in Jewish homes all the time. And Jesus says, listen, they think you're dead, but I'm going to raise you up, Talitha Kum. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, the voice of God saying to some of you, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. It's time to dream again. It's time to believe again. It's time to trust again. It's time to risk again. It's time to love again. Time to Talitha Kum. It's time to get up. And I want to close with this story. I believe that God can do anything, but I haven't seen him do everything. I, I, if this story happened in July of 2008 in my life, I was on a ministry trip and I was with another friend, another pastor, and we were ministering in Mexico. And in, in Mexico, there's a plaza, a center of the, of every town or village, there's a plaza. And we went to the plaza because we knew people would gather. And we just started preaching. And we had kids doing dramas and skits and different things. And the crowd grew. And we just preached Jesus. And then we invited them to come and receive prayer. I've never seen so many miracles in my life. And listen, you don't have to leave the country to see miracles. You just have to get around desperate people that have no other options. And, and a guy from another village came because he saw what was happening and begged us, please come to my house to pray for my mom. He said she had a stroke and she's paralyzed in half of her body. And the doctor sent her home. There's nothing more they can do. They basically send her home to die. They said, just let her go die at home. He was so desperate. He was not a follower of Jesus. He was, he was just so desperate. And I'm thinking, this is straight out of the Bible. Like people just telling us to come to their home. I'm like, we gotta do this. So my friend Eric, another pastor, he said, let's go. And so we started leaving and he said, bring Danny with you. And I'm like, See, you need to know Danny was like the liability on the trip. <laughs> Danny was that one kid that you were hoping Jesus would get a hold of him on the trip. He was kind of like you had enough good apples so the bad apple wasn't going to ruin the team culture and all that. And so I'm like, no, we don't want to bring Danny. Like he's doubt and unbelief. Jesus kicked him out of the room. He's like, bring Danny. I think he needs to be there. So we go into this house, and if I, if I told you that I believed God was going to heal her, I'd be lying to you. I knew he could, but I didn't know what we would see. And when we walked into that house, the only way I can describe it is I felt a spirit of death. It was heavy. It was heavy. Man, we pulled out our cell phones and just played some Bethel worship music just to invite the Holy Spirit into that oppressive environment. And 
then I went and I, and I crawled over next to this lady's bed and I just sat next to her. Her face was sagging and drooped on one side because of the stroke. Her arm was curled up and paralyzed and she was laying in bed, basically her deathbed. And her son said, through our translator, could you just please pray? I, I have no idea what else to do. And so we began to pray. And I can't even describe for you fully what happened, but this woman who was half paralyzed from the stroke, she began to move around in the bed. I actually told her, hey, 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 like sit still. She began to reach her arm up that was paralyzed and began to move it. And then she began to smile, the face that was drooped her eye that was sagging in her face, she began to smile at us and use the side of her body that had been paralyzed. I'm telling you what, when you invite Jesus into the home, things happen. So watch this. I, I look over, because listen, the miracle's not just for you, it's for everybody connected to you. I look over at my translator, Lorenzo, who was backslidden. He loved Jesus, but he had fallen in love with the things of the world, and he's weeping. I look at the son who invited us in to pray for his mom, and he's standing in the middle of his house with his hands up, screaming this prayer. He's saying, God, invade me. Jesus, save me. I'm like, I guess we don't have to lead him in the sinner's prayer. <laughs> I look over at Danny, and Danny is weeping. Listen, this kid grew up mocking people and mocking spiritual gifts and prayer language and all these different things. He opened his mouth to worship and all of a sudden, a prayer language came out that he used to mock people for. Now he is speaking to God directly, spiritually. Come on, when you invite Jesus into your house, into your home, he will affect every person connected to you. Jairus didn't deserve it. The woman with the issue of blood didn't do anything to deserve it. They were just desperate. They were just hungry. And you don't care about public appearance when you need a spiritual breakthrough. You invite Jesus in. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads all across this room. I want to pray for two groups of people as we close. First, you're here and you have a relationship with Jesus. But you want to hunger for him at another level. Like you just need some spiritual firepower in your life. You need your heart to be warm to him all over again. You don't strive your way there. You just surrender your way there. And I just want right now, I just ask you, the only way I know how just to open your heart and just say, God, I'm hungry to be hungry. I need your grace. God, I needed your grace from the beginning, and I need your grace right now in the middle. Jesus, I pray that you would give us a spiritual hunger, a hunger that would affect our children that we would speak life like you spoke life over that girl. The second group of people, I want to pray for those you may have come in today, and there's no way we're slipping out of here without giving you an opportunity. You've been around Jesus. You've been to church. You may have sung songs, but you know in your heart you don't have a life-giving relationship with him. I want to lead you in a simple prayer so that you can leave today knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you don't have to hide out in shame and that you have a very real connection and relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to ask, while all of our heads are bowed, Freedom Church, if you have already become a Christ follower, I want you to pray this out loud for those that are praying it for the first time. I'm going to give you the words to borrow because the Bible says that with our hearts we believe, but with our mouth we confess. And so let's pray. If that's you, if that's you, whether it's the first time or you're coming back, respond to the Holy Spirit's work in your heart right now. Let's pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, come on church, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And though I didn't deserve it, you paid for my sin on that cross. I receive your life for my death. I receive your grace I receive your Holy Spirit just say this, say Jesus thank you for bringing me into your family for changing me from the inside out with every head bowed I just want to ask real quickly, quickly 
If you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up and say, I prayed with you, Pastor Josh. I'm, I'm connecting with Jesus. I'm repenting of my sin. I'm connecting with Jesus. I'm spiritually going to another level. Thank you for your, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, Freedom Church. God bless you. Can you stand to your feet? Come on, can we celebrate right now? Come on, let's worship. Let's worship. We're saying, God, I'm hungry for you. You're all that I need. Become all that I want. Come on, I thirst for your presence. Let's lift this up. Lift it up as your prayer.